Ladies and gentlemen, this is Japan just dealt Russia a devastating blow. What? Okay, am I the one who's only panicking every time you hear this kind of a news? Like, I'm sure like there are people like join the team, either their team this or team that, and just like, <laughs> aren't you scared even a bit? Like this could spiral out of control, right? Even on you know like big countries and then like they're like intelligence agencies are kind of afraid like this might spiral out to like nuclear war and shit am i the only one who panics about nuclear war i mean come on because people are like oh come on that's not going to happen that is the mentality people have but one thing i've noticed especially in late you know very recently like things that might feel bigger and think like, oh surely that's not going to happen it happens very like easily it's very easy to cross some line apparently that's that's one thing that's becoming common and like I don't know, man, like tactical nukes, smaller nukes, you know, like all you need is one thing, right? Even the smallest nuke, like tactically, you know, like attacking some place that might cause big issue, right? Because if you do it once, you can do it again type of shit. I don't know. I remember like, uh, you, you know, America basically gave direct warning to Russia or some shit, like everything like, okay, but if you like use nuke, that's when we're going to have like real problem type of shit. It's, you know, like I'm paraphrasing, but something like that. Obviously I'm paraphrasing, right? And I'm pretty sure like, you know, like just yesterday or something, there was a news about Putin talking about how Britain and US is going to face problem. Uh, because of something like they announced something, they announced some defense pact. I don't know what that was. I didn't mean, really watch the full, but it, that was a headline, right? News headline. Like, okay, where this is going? And now Japan. Uh, I don't know where this is going. Obviously, this is by the channel uh, military show. So that's why this one. If you like my next phone, subscribe. That way, I know which type of videos to react to more. You know, I like to be informed about like geopolitics <laughs> through YouTube uh, channels like this because I don't, I don't know if I trust news channels. Not gonna lie. So, yeah, let's do this one. Russian President Vladimir Putin is in crisis mode. After approximately two and a half years of fighting, his military still hasn't been able to take Ukraine. In fact, for every territorial gain comes an even fiercer Ukrainian response. Worse yet for Putin, that response is increasingly being backed by the rest of the world. Hundreds of billions of dollars in military aid have been sent to Ukraine, with commitments being made for many billions more. Plus, Putin now has to face up to the fact that his actions have resulted in many NATO members taking steps to rearm themselves so that they're prepared for a possible conflict with Russia. This was not how the annexation of Ukraine was supposed to go. Russia anticipated- I just saw the Sweden, Sweden, Finland video, uh, how F-35, uh, there was a practice of F-35 landing on a road there, just as a practice. So yeah, preparation is there, which is like, okay, it uh, wouldn't have happened any other time, but because of this, it happened, right? It's storming in and taking the country in a matter of weeks, with the West not even having a chance to respond. That didn't happen. Still, at least it's just the West Putin has to worry about, right? It's no surprise that Russia's age-old enemy has come to Ukraine's defense. To Putin, this is just another example of the West trying to exert geopolitical control over the rest of the world by sticking its collective nose into business with which it has nothing to do. Except it's not just the West that opposes Russia. Since the outbreak of the Ukraine war, Japan has positioned itself as not only a partner to Ukraine, but an increasingly viable enemy to Russia. Now the country has dealt another devastating blow to Putin's ambitions and, with further changes to its internal policy, could become an even bigger thorn in the Russian president's side. That brings us to the video. We're going to dig into the latest devastating- Okay, isn't that a stretch though? Because Japan is West. Since World War II, Japan has been their defense has relied on USA. I mean, obviously, since the atomic bombs. So, wherever West allies, isn't Japan gonna ally the same way? Or am I missing something? I don't know. But it makes sense like Japan like backing the same thing the West is backing. Is that really that big of a deal? Dating blow Japan has dealt Russia, along with exploring everything else that Japan is doing to oppose Putin's regime. You'll also learn why all of this is happening in the first place before we explore the key debate that rages on about Japan's approach to the Ukraine conflict. But first, the devastating blow. In February 2024, officials from Japan and Ukraine met to discuss a new investment treaty that could essentially act as a way for Japan to funnel money into Ukraine even as it faces constant bombardment from Russia. During those treaty negotiations, Japan reaffirmed a vow it made at the beginning of the conflict to continue providing support to reconstruct Ukraine. Those talks were extremely productive. Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida announced a bilateral tax treaty in which both countries will codify a set of tax rules that prevent double taxation of companies and individuals. 
In other words, Japanese investors who want to pour money into Ukraine no longer need to worry about being taxed by both Japan and Ukraine. While this may seem small, it's a sign that Japan is increasingly committed to helping Ukraine. Mm, Japan is really efficient, right? Japan is one of the countries that can do a lot of like signif significant things like this, right? I'm pretty sure Japan's currency is not that strong because of this reason, like taxation and things. They refuse to tax certain things. It's a very clever thing, right? Uh, I mean, what does that mean, like currency? Like a lot of a uh, lot of time, if you don't like read economics, you realize like okay, J Japan's currency is like equal to dollar or something. It's like really weak. But what does that mean? Weak? Maybe they want it weak there. There's like strategic advantage to that, and there is uh, many reasons behind uh, taxation and things which is they're not doing. Yeah, their currency is at that state, and Japan is known for like you know like really, uh, you know like strong mentality right like even like uh, the bullet trains and everything they are always on time type of shit like they can't be late otherwise like fare is free and shit like that so japan is really like if they want to do something they're going to like focus on then do it like really efficiently by making it easier for its investors to spend the money in the country money that ukraine sorely needs to rebuild and fund its fight against russia Japan will support these new tax rules by easing visa controls, again making it easier for Japanese investors to enter and invest in Ukraine, in addition to providing more support to Japanese venture capital companies in Ukraine. Though Kishida didn't provide further details at the time, his Ukrainian counterpart Denis Shmayal later posted on the social media platform Telegram that Japan would create a two-part program through which it would provide 1.35… Prime Minister of Ukraine? Ukraine is under attack, like under invasion, right? This is like war times. Do prime minister even have any job at that point? Because I'm pretty sure like president would like overtake. I don't know how like their thing is working. They are prime minister. So do they have like similar government as India? Because uh, any other like America, Russia and other places like president is like the, the one with the power. I'm guessing the same thing is with the Ukraine. Or prime minister is just like, like, you know, like head of the ministers, I guess. Usually that's not how it works in India, even though presidents still have their president thing, right? All the things apply the same way. But but yeah, in the war times, like, isn't like this martial law type of shit? Uh, like president, obviously Zelensky takes power over everything else. So what job prime minister does around that time? I don't know. A billion dollars in support to Japanese investors working in Ukraine. That's $1.35 billion that could turn into many more billions over time all money Ukraine can use to fund both its war effort and its reconstruction. According to Shmiao, the new tax treaty also opens doors for major Japanese car makers such as Toyota and Honda to open factories in Ukraine. Again, these production facilities are future-focused, providing work for Ukraine. <laughs> this is so good. Toyota, do you want to put factory in Ukraine? There's bombardments everywhere, bullets flying, so then usual then. That's basically what they're going to be response there. Yeah, you can hit it with like anti-tank mine, 50 calibers, Toyota truck's still gonna work. And Honda's like, you want a working engine? There you go. Welcome to Honda. Ukrainians after the war, while showcasing how international companies are far more willing to do business with Ukraine than they are with Russia. A devastating blow for Putin. And it's not the only blow that Japan has landed in recent months. According to Voice of America, Japan had already provided $10 billion in aid to Ukraine as of February 2024. It's important to note that this aid has been both humanitarian and financial, not the type of military aid that many other countries have provided. Following the conference between Ukraine and Japan's prime ministers, it was also revealed that Japan has pledged to provide a further $12 billion in financial assistance, of which $4.7 billion would arrive in Ukraine by the end of February 2024. That places Japan among the top five countries in the world in terms of providing financial aid to Ukraine, only falling behind the US, Germany, the UK and various European institutions. The message being delivered to Putin by Japan is clear. Tokyo supports you. Okay, isn't Jap what is the economy of Japan? Isn't like, is it top five? Uh, USA, China, Germany. Which one is fourth? Fourth is Japan? Fifth is India, right? So what is fourth? Is it UK or Japan? So it makes sense, you know, like GDP wise, like, yeah, they will be top five, I guess. Ukraine. And if Putin didn't receive that message from this new volley of financial commitments, he'd have certainly gotten it when Fumio Kishida stood in front of the US Congress to deliver a speech on April 11, 2024. On that day, Kishida told Congress the US leadership on the global stage is indispensable, reinforcing Japan's commitment to what Putin would consider the Western global hegemony. Pointedly, Kishida also told those assembled, as I often say, Ukraine of today may be East Asia of tomorrow, before further lauding the US for the support it provides not just to Ukraine, but to the Indo-Pacific region. 
He characterized Putin's special military operation as an onslaught from Moscow and asked how long it would be before countries in the Indo-Pacific, Japan included, would face similarly harsh realities were it not for American intervention. Kashida wrapped up the speech with more of uh, you know ge geographical uh, you know history there. Japan and Russia already shares islands which both disputes. Japan is just basically there. Russia, you can basically see Russia. I think like that's how close Japan is, right? Not to mention North Korea, also aligned to Russia. So Japan has a real stake in it, right? Uh, if uh, North Korea and Russia, like let's say Russia backed North Korea, shows aggression towards Japan, Japan's gonna be screwed. So Japan has a stake there, basically. That's what it is. Like the enough conflict, and enough history is there. So Japan is basically gonna think that like I could be next, right? So where this is gonna end, type of way. The simple message to Putin: Japan will continue to stand with Ukraine. If Putin believed he had any hope of repairing his relationship with Japan, at least while the Ukraine war is ongoing, those seven words put an end to that notion. But in truth, the relationship between the two countries has been tense for decades, with Japan's announcement of more financial aid to Ukraine being just the latest. Yeah, in what relationship? I mean, like, if Russia's relationship is good with West, then there's going to have good with, like, Japan. And like I said, like, there's enough friction there with the islands and disputed islands and things, border issues and things, North Korea also being there. Right, China just there, so there is enough issue where Russia aligns that Japan is going to be opposite, obviously. In a series of disagreements that have built up to this moment. Disagreements such as those over a small collection of islands that Russia calls the Kurils and Japan dubs the Northern Territories. In the wake of World War II, the Soviet Union seized these islands, which are just 810 miles northeast of the northernmost Japanese island of Hokkaido. That seizure has been disputed ever since, with Reuters pointing out that World War II hostilities between Japan and Russia have still not ended due to their differing stances on these islands. These stances have only grown more resolute due to recent Russian actions. According to the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS, Russia appeared to be on the verge of handing the Northern Territories back to Japan during the early 2010s. That possibility actually had an impact on Japan's foreign policy, claims CSIS as former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe spent much of his tenure working to improve relations between Japan and Russia to create enough goodwill to enable an agreement to be reached. Diplomatic talks, joint tourism projects, and even Japanese investment in local Russian economic development all stemmed from this approach. But Russia essentially took all of that goodwill and tossed it aside. Since 2015, Russia has been steadily increasing its military presence in the Northern Territories. With Come on, man, I don't understand that. Russia's economy needs a boost. Japan is the boost they can use. Japan is like one of the one of the countries, which is like economical powerhouse, especially in the output. Like how Germany, Japan, America, these are the countries. Now China is also that. Right? These are the powerhouse countries, which if you do business with, even your economy would easily come up. Right? So if like they had made agreement, like you know whatever, like they agreed, like giving back islands and things. Now like you know some. Uh, you know, like good, uh, you know, relations with the industries and things. Russia's economy would have like shot up, right? Uh, Japan is the one, one like uh, window to the West R Russia could have used because through Japan, they can do business with many things, many places, right? Uh, India, Japan also has like good relations where, you know, there are a lot of Japanese companies and factories here, right? India, Russia, you know, has good relations that could have worked like that. I don't understand like why why ruin that right there could have been great opportunity to boost up uh, you know your gdp and economy satellite imagery showing putin has been building infrastructure that csis claims reaches as close as 14 miles away from hokkaido these developments include the building of barracks large enough to host a population of 7000 on kunashiri along with the storage of bal anti ship missiles or asms on the island that island's southernmost point lies just 10 miles away from japanese territory Similar developments include the construction of barracks and installation of Bastion ASMs on Itarofu, just 50 miles outside Japanese territory, along with the expansion of a base and development of a Russian airfield on Paramashiri. That island is just 380 miles from Japan. The Bal and Bastion ASMs have ranges between 185 and 310 miles, leading to Russia essentially sending a message to Japan that it could strike practically any ship near Hokkaido if it wished to do so. Tensions were being raised throughout the 2010s. Then came Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which led to Japan showing that it wouldn't be cowed by Putin's aggression. Even with a growing Russian threat looming to its north, Japan had consistently provided financial aid to Ukraine. 
Furthermore, the country was one of the first to coordinate with the US and other members of the Group of Seven or G7 nations, a collective of the world's seven strongest economic powers, to implement punitive sanctions. These initial sanctions included asset freezes, restrictions on SWIFT payment access, and restrictions on the import and export of various controlled items. Yeah, the SWIFT thing was the most powerful thing you can do, uh, at least in this way, economical way, because that's world trans transactions just halted there, right? Whether people like it or not, world transactions are mostly, if not completely, uh, Western bound, right? Even China has to like, you know, do that basically because most of the China's wealth come from West, doing business with wealth, West, that's how it works. So SWIFT transaction was a big deal, right? Uh, so that basically cuts Russia off to like most of like how they're going to use currency and things, right? Uh, basically implementing some form of iron curtain just, just where how soviet union was like not not be able to do much business like going back to like a barter trade type of system right uh, recently that's how they've been doing business like with north korea like they give some things get artillery in the back because like if you can you know like use currency like that of course you're going to do that more sanctions have followed April 2022 saw Japan revoke Russia's most favored nation status. More asset freezes and export bans were implemented, including bans on luxury goods from Russia. Even in 2024, Japan continues to build on its sanctions. February 2024 saw it join with the G7 to place a price cap on Russian oil, with even more asset freezes and export bans coming in March, April, and June. Japan has also shown its support for Ukraine in other ways. For instance, Fumio Kishida was the president of the G7 in 2023, a position he used to ensure that global attention remained on Russia's actions in Ukraine, according to CSIS. His actions included visiting Kyiv in March 2023, the first time a Japanese leader has visited an active conflict zone since World War II. Uncoincidentally, that visit to Kyiv happened around the same time that Putin held a summit in Moscow with China's President Xi Jinping, with the two events seeming to be the drawing of lines in the sand between the four nations. Kishida's wartime visit also marked a break in Japanese tradition, in which it generally focused on diplomacy rather than directly supporting sides in conflicts. Japan was no longer keeping out of the war. Through Kishida, Ukraine has also been given an opportunity to build relationships with Asian nations it may not have otherwise worked alongside. For instance, May 2023 saw Japan's Prime Minister invite Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky to a G7 summit, to which Kishida has also invited representatives from India, the African Union, and the Association of Southeast Nations. It was another blow to Putin, as he saw his current rival engaging in diplomatic conversations with countries he would like to curry favor with. So, we see the latest blow Japan has dealt to Russia. The yeah, I mean, uh, that is strong, isn't it? I mean, first, when you realize, like, uh, you know, what, what does visit have to do with anything? You have no idea how easily people can forget things. If there are conflicts happening in the world, and then world moves on to something else, like it happened with the Middle Eastern conflict, very easy to forget, like, some kind of a war is happening in, like, Russia and Ukraine. But, like, when your own prime Japanese prime minister visits here and there, like, oh, what is happening? It's very the, easily the, you know, like, news titles can shift it, like, oh... Japanese Prime Minister visited like war torn Ukraine or whatever just to remind people of oh, this shit is happening. You think like is it like what people are stupid? Why would they not remember? It's like at the, this kind of a global stage at this scale, things are very easy forgettable. Uh, uh, that's just fucked up when you really say it out loud like that. But yeah, it is right. So when you keep the you know you know like news headlines to that right, it is right. As uh, you know, the agency said like you know Japan made sure. The people remember like a war is happening right now so it doesn't like because the only way governments can help ukraine is that their own people agree with it and if their own people forgets well, like you know like in usa that was happening like why are we giving aid in ukraine that much this and that like there was a friction there like should we aid ukraine this much like when biden was giving so much aid like people were actually showing friction in congress things like this like can amp up people's support for ukraine and in turn like governments can actually show support so very psychological things are happening in politics like that the promise of billions of dollars in ongoing financial aid is actually just the largest following several diplomatic jabs Japan has delivered. All of this leads us to a question. Why has Japan chosen to now fully support Ukraine in its efforts against Russia? Some of the reasons have already been explained. Japan's relationship with Russia has always featured a certain amount of tension, even during the periods when Japan was trying to extend the diplomatic olive branch. 
Putin has only added to those tensions by militarizing the Northern Territories, transforming the island into very real threats to Japan and its sovereignty, even if we disregard Japan's territorial claims on the island. I still don't understand that, like what kind of a diplomatic failure is this, right? Even if you are planning to attack Ukraine, you want Japan to not be against you. And you already started the talk, like, I might give you back the island. Like, why backtrack from that? Why show aggression like that by building barracks and things? Especially when Japan was, like, ready to do business with you, which could, could have helped your economy as well. So I don't understand that element. Maybe there's more to it than that, then I guess I or we understand. But that feels weird to me, right? And yeah, Japan basically bringing a lot of Asian countries into conversation, that would be problematic because Russia's, like, biggest uh, economical partners would be China and India right now, right? Because India is still doing business in that way, getting cheap oil and things. China is obviously directly like supporting Russia like that. In big stage, these two are. So if India basically slowly moves towards like Japan, Ukraine and Western side, that's a problem for Russia, right? Because India is slowly already moving towards that. Already buying US equipment, US military equipment, things like that. Slowly like walking away from like Russia, Soviet style thing like... India is openly saying, like, I'm going to do what's best for my people. Not like, if, if I find better equipment at best, I'm going to buy that type of way. That's why they back away from, what is a Su-57, the fifth generation one? Because they, they basically probably did deal with somewhere somewhere else. Or like, uh, you know, trying to build their own thing with the Halamka and things like that, right? And obviously that's based on like US, uh, you know, like... Uh, and people are told me in the comments, like on that video, like, oh, come on, India's going to build fifth generation. I get what you mean, but I'm pretty sure like a lot of US, uh, uh, you know, military information and things, they're backing behind it. India can't just directly build fifth generation fighter. I'm pretty sure there's many elements that are happening in the background. Nevertheless, these issues alone wouldn't be enough to explain Japan's slow moving away from attempted diplomacy to full-blown support for Ukraine. There are other factors at play. For instance, Japan is taking a different approach to its foreign policy than it has in many decades. Following World War II, Japan made the purposeful decision to focus on pacifism in its foreign policy. We see that in its dealings with Russia. Until the last two years, the nations never came to blows, even with Russia claiming territory that Japan believes rightfully belongs to it. In a piece titled Historical Parameters of Japanese Foreign Policy, Brookings points out that this approach has been extremely lucrative for Japan. The institution of the Bretton Woods system, which required currencies to peg themselves to the US dollar, led to extended periods of economic success. Plus, by taking a more passive role, Brookings claims, Japan has been able to weather various crises, revolutions, and wars seen in the Indo-Pacific and East Asia since World War II, coming out practically undamaged in all cases. However, international circumstances are slowly pushing Japan away from its policies of passiveness and pacifism. The increasing modernization of China since 2000 is one such issue, with Japan likely believing that it's slowly losing its position as one of the chief power brokers in the Indo-Pacific as China's influence grows. That growth in Chinese influence can also explain Japan's approach to Russia. Putin and Xi are clearly allies in many respects. That's evident from the previously mentioned summits. Couple that with Russia's militarization of the Northern Territories, and Japan now has two countries that are subtly, and sometimes not so subtly, threatening its sovereignty. In the face of these issues, Japan has needed to change its national strategy. According to CSIS, this change is actually the result of an evolution that began during the Gulf War in 1991. At that time, Japan heavily relied on the Middle East for its oil imports, though it also contributed $13 billion to support the coalition forces fighting in the Gulf. At the time, Japan's actions were criticized as checkbook diplomacy, with many wondering why the country refused to dedicate any of its own forces to support the coalition soldiers. CSIS notes that the criticism marked a change in how Japan approached the concept of international cooperation. The years that followed saw it forming and expanding partnerships with its allies, in addition to boosting its defense spending. The latter efforts culminated in Japan's cabinet approving a request for the country's largest ever defense package. The package will see Japan invest $55.9 billion into its military in 2024, with the number increasing annually until it reaches a peak of $62.5 billion in 2027. Add Japan's inclusion in a trilateral defense agreement with the US and South Korea into the mix, in addition to strengthening its ties with NATO, India and Australia, and you have a country that's shifting its foreign policy. Passivity couldn't work in the current global landscape. CSIS notes that these changes in approach appear to be generally supported by the Japanese people. For instance, a survey conducted in March 2022, a month after Russia invaded Ukraine, revealed that 77% of Japan's citizens believed that the international community needed to band together to stop the Russian invasion. 
If they didn't, the respondents worried, the territorial changes Russia enforced could pave the way for future attempts at change, such as a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Again, it comes back to Japan becoming increasingly concerned about power plays by other nations. Russia taking Ukraine would make China more confident in attempting the same in the Indo-Pacific with Taiwan. So it was crucial for Japan that it became part of the collective effort to prevent Putin's special military operation, as doing so means it could justify being part of future collective efforts to stop Chinese expansion. It's a complete turnaround in policy, and a turnaround that hit hard with Putin, who may have believed that he could have maintained cordial relations with Japan even as he invaded Ukraine. That could have been a possibility were it not for another change happening in Japan. The politicians who had spent so long trying to build a stronger relationship with Russia are gradually aging out. That's according to an October 2023 report by the Carnegie Endowment, which noted that even as Japan expressed its support for Ukraine, various pro-Russia lobbies inside the country were making headlines. These older politicians were claiming NATO's responses to Russia were provocative and that Ukraine had misguided policies. However, these lobbyists have been growing quieter since the 2010s, when pro-Russia policies in Japan were at their peak. The assassination of Shinzo Abe was the trigger for this turnaround. The man who had often referred to Putin as Dear Vladimir was responsible for Japan's failure to sanction Russia during the annexation of Crimea in 2014. He also created plans to strengthen economic cooperation between Japan and Russia in 2016. Even when he stepped down from his role as Prime Minister in 2020, the Carnegie Endowment says his influence within Japan's Liberal Democratic Party would likely have led to more pro-Russian policy. Abe's July 2022 assassination meant Putin lost his biggest Japanese ally. He's also had to watch as other allies such as former Prime Minister Yukio Hatsuyama and Yoshiro Mori have grown too old to have any true influence on Japanese policy. They are now retired. Another pro-Putin influence in Japanese politics, Muneo Suzuki, was the first foreign politician Putin received after he became Russia's president. Suzuki even served as an unofficial advisor in Russia's policies under Abe, showcasing just how strong his ties with Russia became. But Suzuki is now working under a cloud of internal suspicion. His imprisonment for corruption in the 2000s hasn't helped with every. I mean, Benigno Suzuki Abe wasn't he the one only like pro-Russian? Like the picture that paints implies that like. He's like pro-Russian, like how other corrupt politicians are pro-Russian. But wasn't he the one who just wanted to like have better relations with Russia? So if Russia gives back the island and things like that, right? He was trying to do that, wasn't he? And then Russia basically like backtracked from that, created barracks and things. If he was still president, wouldn't he do the same thing as the current prime minister is doing? Not president, prime minister. If Shinzo Abe was still prime minister, let's just say, wouldn't he do the same thing the current prime minister is doing? Because all he was trying to do is like ease the tense and create better relations it didn't work then it didn't work right i don't know was he really pro-russian every effort he's made to visit russia since february 2022 being blocked by his own party there's a new generation of politicians coming to the fore in japan and with each loss of the old guard putin's influence has waned to the point where it's almost impossible for him to maintain a relationship with japan Signing a mutual defense pact with North Korea in June 2024 was essentially Putin putting an end to any chances of rebuilding that relationship. To Japan, that pact will be little more than another sign of aggression to go along with Russia's actions in the Northern Territories and its allegiance with China. After all, North Korea represents another major threat to Japan in the Indo-Pacific, as well as a threat to Japan's South Korean allies. As the Council on Foreign Relations highlights, allying with Russia makes North Korea even more dangerous, adding to Fumio Kishida's claims that Russian aggression in Ukraine can't be seen as a Europe-only problem. All of this brings us back to Japan's decision to send even more financial aid to Ukraine. Putin's responses to this powerful blow indicate just how far Russia's relationship with Japan has fallen. In June 2024, Kyoto News reported on the Russian president's comments that the current conditions between the countries aren't conducive to them coming back to the negotiating table to create a peace treaty for the post-World War II era. Japan would likely agree, though not for the same reasons as Putin expresses. According to Putin, the blame firmly rests with Japan and its support of Ukraine. Everything that's been done has been done by Japan, Putin claimed, seemingly ignorant, likely purposefully, of the fact that Japan's decisions are being informed by his actions and his special military operation. These comments came after the suspension of peace talks with Japan in March 2022. Putin went even further, claiming that he will not shy away from visiting the islands that make up the Northern Territories, essentially telling Japan that he's happy to instigate by reinforcing their status as Russian islands. Reading between the lines, we can see that Japan's deepening support for Ukraine dealt a body blow to Putin. It's no coincidence that he ended the peace treaty talks in March, by which point Japan had already been supporting Ukraine for two years. 
The pledge of a further $12 billion in aid seems to be the straw that finally broke his back, with that money sending a clearer message than ever before that Japan is no longer an ally to Russia, it is an enemy. The status as an enemy leads us to the final question we'll ask in this video. Will Japan's pledges of financial aid ever turn into pledges of military aid? Debates have raged over whether Japan should take the final step in solidifying its support of Ukraine. If it does, the blow would be even more devastating to Putin than the deterioration of relationships he's had to watch over the last two years and Japan's financial aid pact. Yeah, I think the nuclear threat looms whenever you do that and Japan would not be the one to test that being the only country where nuke was ever used. So I don't think Japan would be the one who tests that resolve, right? It's, it's mostly based on like how West would react, I'm thinking, right? If West decides to join the fight, maybe then Japan would do it, right? But so far, like France, Germany, America, UK, they have, they have not, you know, like shown military aid like that, like put, foot, you know, food on the ground, right? So would, would Japan be the one to do that? I don't know. And yeah, military, you know, like, uh, you know, other type of aids, right? Sure, Japan can do it like that, right? Like how other countries are doing it, right? Uh, they must be doing it right now, I guess, under the wraps type of way, but openly they can do that. Yeah, Japan is like, yeah, you know, has really great industry military-wise, right? So, yeah. But yeah, enough countries are already supporting Ukraine in that way. Like maybe Japan might not do that because USA, UK, Germany, they are already doing it packages combined. Still, Japan remains reluctant to provide weapons, to an extent. In truth, Japan has already found a handful of diplomatic workarounds that allow it to indirectly provide weapons to Ukraine without actually providing them itself. For instance, there appear to be no conditions placed on the billions in financial aid it's provided, meaning Ukraine is likely free to use that money to purchase weapons if it so chooses. If nothing else, that aid is helping to keep Ukraine's economy afloat during a period when it would be at deep risk of collapsing. Again, that can help Ukraine to purchase weapons, as well as enable it to keep its manufacturing base running so it can build weapons of its own. More interestingly, Japan has found several workarounds in the weapons department. For instance, Nikkei Asia reported in July 2024 that Japan had agreed to sell $19 million worth of Patriot missiles to the United States, supposedly to help the US replenish its numbers after it's provided hundreds of these missiles to Ukraine. There are no conditions on how the US uses these missile systems once they land in Washington. It's very possible, perhaps even likely, that the Patriot systems Japan is providing to the US will eventually find their way to Ukraine, with the US essentially acting as an intermediary so Japan doesn't have to deliver the weapons directly. Russia is aware of this. Its foreign ministry claimed that the appearance of any Japanese missiles in Ukraine would lead to consequences for Russians' relations with Japan. However, given the state of those relations, it's likely that Japan isn't too worried about what those consequences. Yeah, you know what, I have to go now, but yeah, video's almost over. Basically, that makes sense, all of this, right? Uh, the relationships are already bad, right? Uh, Japan has a stake in, like, maintain, you know, maintaining, uh, you know, like, supporting Ukraine because North Korea, China, and also Russia at the border, Russia already having disputed islands, right? Talk, uh, you know, ending with Japan about the island. Uh, the, there might have been hope once, but it's not no longer there. So why would Japan not support Ukraine, right? Japan can give like financial aids, which in turn can be used to for the military aid. They're probably not going to give military aid directly, obviously. Uh, other countries are Western countries with Japan allies with already just doing that. So yeah, and I don't know, like in future, like people need to be really careful. Right? I know people still say like, oh, Russia's nukes is not working, Russia is not going to do that, that. You, all you need is one working nuke to send a message. And I'm pretty sure like even the smaller country, smaller nuclear country can manage to make one functioning nuke. Russia can definitely do it. Right? So it's, it's all about the message. It's all about being the first. And once you like crosses that threshold, too many countries out there have nukes. China, Pakistan, places like that. So that's a fucked up world, right? Especially for India, that's fucked up because China, Pakistan, both nuclear powers bordering it. And once somebody uses nukes, they can use nukes at any time, which can turn really bad very easily. So I don't know, I don't know, future kind of feels fucked up. Who knows where this is going to go? If like uh, peace talks doesn't happen really soon, like it can escalate in any direction. But yeah. Right, well, that was just like, yeah, Japan just dealt Russia a devastating blow. Yeah, just, I thought this was like ongoing thing, but I don't know. Yeah, so yeah, if peace talks better happen soon, right? Like, in the end, it has to end with diplomacy because 
however you go about a military response is going to be bad for all sides there is yeah it's just going to end up bad so it has to end with diplomacy otherwise everything's fucked all right i'll see you next time